All right, good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good, good. Well, I'm glad you could come back. Um, today is our last session, and today is the, mem the memorial of um, Our Lady of the Rosary. And so I thought maybe as a prayer we could begin by saying a decade of the Rosary together for the intention of the conversion of the world, for the end of all wars, sins against the flesh, and for our own personal intention. So we'll begin with the sign of our faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, and save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, well, just as a review, um, Last week we spent a number, uh, quite a while talking about conflict, talking about some of the current issues that exist in our church today that are definitely challenging to go through and, uh, and that we need to integrate into those issues a holy zeal for being called by God to evangelize. So sometimes when that zeal isn't there, that, that fear of conflict or persecution or maybe even rejection, um, all of those different things will definitely inhibit our, our zeal or our attempts to evangelize, even to our family. Now, uh, interestingly enough, um, Father Chris Gillespie, I think you know him, right? He was here. Um, he uh, wrote his thesis in terms of the new evangelization on Mary, and he described her as the star of the new evangelization. And uh, our opening hymn at Mass today was, uh, was dedicated to Our Lady, uh, Queen of the Sea, Star of the Ocean Star, giving us a sense of navigation. 
And, uh, and today, I think that's actually quite relevant given that um, we're celebrating the uh, victory over in Lepanto, where there were many Christian slaves taken by the Ottoman Empire, and uh, the, the war was successful. The Navy was able to overcome them by the intercession of Our Lady through the praying of the Rosary. And all of those slaves who were being oppressed uh, and the terrorists that were coming to destroy the Christian faith um, were able to be overcome uh, in, in that battle. And of course, our, our Holy Father then uh, celebrates this day as our, our Lady of the Rosary in dedication to that. And so I think it's important for us, we talk about the importance of the Holy Spirit being involved in evangelization. I think it's also important for us to talk about our Blessed Mother. And, and that's um, noted, especially in Pentecost, because she was there in the upper room with the apostles. And she's often described, it's a tradition to describe her as the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Um, she's so united to the Holy Spirit um, that they, the two of them together produce the fruit of Jesus Christ within her womb. So by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, uh, Christ was conceived. And so this kind of unity, the spiritual marriage between Mary and the Holy Spirit is something that exists within her prayer life. So she has this perfect prayer to God. So when we're asking for the Holy Spirit to come to us, we often do ask for the Holy Spirit to come through the intercession of our Blessed Mother. And so um, the, the two work together. And that's, that's a, a unique thing that we believe as Catholics, but when you reflect on it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, a lot of the time we, we talk about, you know, why can't I just go directly to God? Well, I'll give you a practical example of why sometimes God wants us to come directly to him, but sometimes he wants us to come to him through others. So a number of years ago, Bishop Fabro has announced that we have a family of parishes. And one of the common things that exists in families of parishes, although we don't have it here uh, right now, is a business manager. And uh, recognizing, of course, that your priest did not go to business school or accounting or, you know, we don't know a lot when it comes to, we, we study theology. <laughs> so uh, the competency for some of us isn't there. For others, uh, maybe they have that gift of administration and, and the background in it. It's certainly not there for me. So I know when, um, when this started, it, it created a huge change in the parish because most people would often just go to Father whenever they wanted permission to do something. Um, but Father needed time to be able to do the sacraments, to visit the schools. And uh, with the shortage of priests being a real reality, and the demands for the priests to be engaged with the people increasing, uh, started to become an unreasonable expectation on the priest. So he asked the business manager, and this was the nature of the model, to take care of some of the other things that the priest didn't have the time to deal with. Now, God has an infinite, infinite amount of time to deal with everything. So that's not the reason why we don't approach God. He's always available to us. But another reason why it's good to have that business manager be involved in the parish is because hopefully he or she has the charism of administration and involving that person with their gifts to build up the kingdom of God is very important, right? Because you're including that person and their gifts in the activity and operation of the parish. And so sometimes what happens is the temptation is we go over people's heads, but they've been given a specific authority or role by design for their own good and for the good of all. Does that make sense? And so in many ways, we have to see that God, God gives certain roles to the angel Gabriel, to St. Michael, the archangel, to St. Raphael. He gives a special role to his mother and that's a gift to her that he wants her to be involved in our lives as a spiritual mother and that we can embrace her and give her joy 
by embracing that. So God is actually trying to weave the whole community together by in involving all of us in that process. Um, and so that's, that's, why, that's a particular reason why we, we acknowledge that sometimes, yes, we come directly to Christ, but sometimes we come to him through Mary and through the saints. Does that make sense? I think it's a very human reality. I, I think if we were always to go over the people's heads that God sent us, we'd have a really hard time understanding um, why God didn't send a multitude of angels rather than choosing the apostles that he did and sending them and saying, if you reject them, you reject the one who sent them and you reject the one who sent me. And so God definitely wants us to be involved in his ministry and to participate in what that is. And all of us have been sent in his name. The moment that we were baptized, and especially when it was deepened through confirmation, you were given authority and the dignity that no one can take away from you to go out and proclaim the gospel. No authority, no a fallen angel, or no angel, and no pope, no bishop, no priest can take away the dignity of your baptism and the call that is imbued in it. In fact, the, the church stands up for that dignity and its dogma and teaching. And, and that's, that's, your, that's your dignity, that's your call, so take pride in that in, in the non-sinful way. Um, but that, that's what we talked about, and, and to be swept up into an excitement for that is really crucial for us. You know, and we're in a world today where I think a lot of God's laws are kind of resentfully abided in. So we, we're not seeing and intuiting the good or the true and the beautiful nature of those laws. And recently, uh, during weekday Mass, I, I gave an example. It's a divisive one. Um, but I gave the example of the Church's teaching around contraception. So that, that's one that, you know, I don't shy away from these topics because I think it's better if we talk about them. I mean, get it all out, right? But um, Pope Paul VI went against the advice of many bishops when he published his document, Humanae Vitae. And he declared, during a time when this was very controversial, during the sexual revolution, right? Uh, the playboy. And uh, in, that, in the midst of that, he, he made it very clear that contraception, the use of contraception, was intrinsically evil. So many people resent this teaching and are very divided by it. And we're living in a culture where, admittedly, it's very hard to accept. It, it is very challenging. So, uh, again, we, we're not being flippant about that. But here we're talking about what's evil, we're given a conclusion, but where's the beauty and the goodness in that teaching? That's what I think St. John Paul II really did and developed when he developed his theology of the body. Was he, he began from the point of view of what is good and beautiful. And so I, I kind of use the example of this um, uh, commercial that I described seeing there is this father who walked into the grocery store and his son, young son, picked up a, a bag of candy, threw it into the shopping cart, and the dad quietly and somewhat passively picked it up and just put it back onto the shelf. And of course, the defiant child picked up the two bags, put it into a shopping cart, and the dad gently and kindly place those back on the shelf. So what did the young boy do? Well, he had a temper tantrum. I don't know if any of you remember being a child having temper tantrums, but I was certainly the number one in my family for that. But I, uh, I you know, you got to learn to emotionally regulate at your own pace. But anyways, uh, he, he was bouncing around the store knocking over oranges and cans and all these other adults were looking at the child, looking at the father, in this kind of judgmental glance, right? Poor parents who have to deal with the judgments of others. But here at the end of the commercial, the father's just standing there. I mean, that would have never happened in my house. I would have been spanked right away, but anyways. Um, so at the end of the commercial, here comes the line. It says, next time use condoms. 
And what's devastating about that phrase, if we, we spend some time reflecting on it, is basically what it's saying, because this child had a temper tantrum, it would have been better if this child had never been born. So that's the world's vision of, of it. Okay, let's look at the church's vision. Church's vision is that the very first thing that God commanded Adam and Eve to do was to be fruitful and multiply. It wasn't a thou shall not. The, the tree came after. So here is God for six days. He's creating in an act of love. That's, that's what he does. The, those two things are always connected. And as he's creating in this act of love, he extends an invitation to the human race to participate in what he's doing. So again, that whole theology of participation. I want you to be like me. And so he invites the human race to do something that not even angels can do, which is with the help of God, to create a soul, an unrepeatable human person, who can never be destroyed, not even by death. That's the church's vision, right? Isn't that incredible? Now, I know I'm saying this as a celibate man, and you're saying, you may be thinking, Father, yes, this is a beautiful, nice thought, but you don't see the diapers, and you don't have to wake up in the morning. And, and I, I get that. There is definitely sacrifice involved. And, and it can be crushing at times, depending on the way in which we experience that new life. But when we have the perspective of God about the beauty of children, those, those new life forms that we have created that give God an opportunity to have more people that he can love and die for, when we see it from that perspective, all of a sudden those sacrifices become worth it. Now, I, I think about it in the same way of being a spiritual father. I think, that, I think as priests, we, we need to know that being a spiritual father is not a title. It's a relationship. And, and that's, that's important. I mean, if it was a title, that's kind of weird, right? Because then I'm the father of people who are older than me, right? Uh, it, it just creates a weird dynamic. But the spiritual relationship gives me a sense of what I'm supposed to do so that when in three o'clock in the morning the hospital calls, one of my children is there dying. Any father would go to the hospital to care for their dying child, right? What about at a wedding? Maybe a spiritual father sharing in the joy of those people who are going to start their new life together. What about in baptism, giving parents and that child the promise covenant of eternal life and being adopted as beloved children of God? These incredible things can involve complaints from parishioners, can involve being cut off on the way to the hospital, can involve waking up in the middle of the night, they can involve harassment, they can involve a lot of dysfunction getting in a tug of war with the statue of St. Anne, as I shared with you, can involve a lot of dysfunctional, but at the end of the day, the people of God are worth the sacrifice. Right? And so all of us are called in whatever vocation we have to some paternal instinct. That's how we're designed. And, and God wants us to see it from his cross's point of view, which is that, yes, the world is dysfunctional. Yes, they're killing me right now, but I still think that they're worth dying for. And that's, that's, that's a beauty and a goodness that, we, that draws us in like a magnet to, to evangelize. Now, if all we hear is that this is wrong, and that's the law, but we don't see the goodness and the beauty in it, uh, then we're probably not drawn to it other than by a sort of fear or a sort of legalism, right? And so it's important that we integrate the relationship or the concept or the notion of what is good, true, and beautiful. So I think as, as a church, 
this is a lot this is really what the new evangelization comes down to the the new evangelization is not talking about using uh, technology or um, you know marketing structures and all these things those are always always important in the background to be to being done but it's talking about presenting the same faith that we've always believed in in a new way and and the new evangelization only applies to those who are raised in the catholic faith but no longer practice or the quasi catechumenate as john paul ii describes evangelization just in general applies to anyone who's never heard the gospel proclaimed and and there are people out there like that we have to remember that i'll never forget when i was a, uh, just becoming an adult i ran into these kids who were skateboarding outside of my home parish mary immaculate we gave them a tour of the church and one of them said why is that man on the plus sign you know and what a beautiful opportunity to share with them the story of our salvation you know this is god and he died for you and that was the symbol that they used to torture at the time so you know there's this incredible incredible opportunity that's upon us that we can be excited about if we're rooted in the goodness and the beauty and the truth of our faith and i think that's part of how the church has to be rehabilitated is that we're operating from a place of joy and we're operating from a place of being drawn rather than pushed or dragged now being pushed or dragged is definitely okay when you're dealing with children because let's be honest children haven't regulated their emotions yet right so we talked about that distinction as well we talked about um, the fact that sometimes there are things that we have to impose but always doing it with and at the same time that relational dimension of involving or inviting that person or proposing a relationship with them does that make sense okay so what i would like to do now before we get started today has, raise your hand if you had an opportunity to do the charism test that i emailed out okay so thank you for doing that uh, at your tables I'd like you to share what the top three or four charisms are and share what you might think that is or how you see it happening in your life and then we'll return back to the big group yeah we're gonna we're gonna talk about that because I think there's an important distinction to make here between doing and operating in a charism um, I mean, a lot of the time, and this is a problem in, in I, I would say, every parish I've ever been in, and probably every human dynamic is sometimes, uh, just to use St. Paul's language, there's an ear trying to be an eye and a hand trying to be a foot. And, and often it, uh, it leads to a disorder in the community. Um, so we, we do have to figure out how to discern these things generally you're answering these questions based on what gives you life. So what gives you joy doing? It, it, it's, not, it's not going to be something that causes you to burn out. It will be something that um, increases your love for God internally. Uh, that's the nature of a charism. So, okay, good question. Any other questions? All right, cool. So um, the next, phase of the question, unless you'd like to continue, is what charisms do you want to see in your parish? We want to, we, yes, question. Well, definitely knowledge. Like more teaching, like really getting into the guts of like philosophy and things yeah. of that nature. So, I thank you, Dominique, for answering my question. Uh, I, I, meant, I meant as a small group, so I'm sorry for not clarifying. Um, but that's great. I would love to take up. Uh, we, have, we have four parishes. Everyone here represents a different parish. The, uh, another way to understand the question is what might not be there that we need to start praying for or drawing and looking out for people who have those gifts to come forward? 
Okay, so, so what are some charisms in our family that maybe our parishes that we have already, but there's other ones that we might need. There's a, maybe a deficit there. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to draw your attention up to the front. <clears throat> Dorothy, are we recording? Okay. Um, so, I, I would like to take up um, what some of you have said um, at your tables about what charisms you're kind of yearning for, longing for in your parish. And, and then I will uh, pray for those. And I ask you to pray for them too. Um, but also, I, you know, if there's something that you're looking for um, and desire from someone else, then start looking for people who have those gifts. Ask the Lord to show you who they might be and then call them forward. You know, you could say something along the lines of, you know, you're a great reader. Uh, when you proclaim the word of God, it's like Christ is speaking directly to me. Um, could you consider that? If they're a terrible reader, don't ask them to come up, okay? <laughs> you don't want to force anything that isn't going to help anyone. Um, same thing with hospitality. If someone is just so generous and they're able to make a person feel known, seen, wanted, and belonging, uh, call them forward to be a greeter. You know, these are these are things that we as a parish, the one one priest or two priests, or even the staff, we we can't do that without knowing everyone. So, what are uh, what are some of the charisms you're looking for? Uh, and we'll start with this table here. Go ahead, Pollyanne. <laughs> I think we have all of them. Like, I see people mm -hmm. with every single one of these. And um, I don't... Yes, there are... So, Dom had said knowledge. Knowledge? Is that what he said? Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree. That's very important. All of them are very important because if, because if our parish... If our parishes only had knowledge, but we didn't have those that were willing to serve and to mm -hmm. prophesy and to um, all of them, they're all very important and they need to work together. Yeah. So I guess I guess my question was meant to be in terms of, um, you know, our, do we need to fill a gap? You know, is there a need for more catechesis? Is there a need for more greeters, for more hospitality, you know, like coffee Sundays, those kinds of things that can knit a community together? Um, that, that's kind of what I mean. So I, I'm not implying that the parish doesn't have the charisms already passively sitting there, but where can we call them forward? And so, so all of them, we need all of them, is your point. Yeah. Okay, back, the, back table there. Yeah, so one of the ones we talked about was hospitality, um, and there are kind of some different senses to it. Um, like, I'm the sort of person that likes to put on a party and make the people feel welcome, but there's a different element to it that I think our culture needs. Like, we talked about the new evangelization, and there is, there's a different tone in our culture right now. So when we're dealing with reading people into our churches, for example, um, and albeit there's a difference between having kind of like a gaggle of people talking past <laughs> the mouth of the church, but that we no longer have a culture where someone can kind of walk into a church and pretend like they belong until they kind of figure it out. You have someone that walk, you know, maybe in a moment of desperation and a moment of grace comes into a church for the first time and doesn't know what to do. They don't know to find their own cue. You know, they kind of assume it's like a restaurant where you wait to be seated or something. Um, so, Given the change of culture, are we in a position to really make those people feel um, like there's somewhere for them to go? Yeah. Life, you raise a good point. I remember when we were in the seminary, one thing that was happening that Sister Loretta had to correct us on. You never want to get a nun correcting you, but uh, she, was a, she was a pleasant one, though. But she uh, noticed that a lot of the seminarians that had been there for a long time, as the hymn was coming to a close, we'd close the book early. And it was almost like, oh, I already know all this. And, and, and then you had the newer guys 
who were like, but I don't know that. And I remember, um, I, m I remember in, in my parish in Windsor that I was assigned, um, I would always hold on to the Apostles' Creed card. Remember those cards? And I would hold on to it and read it. And I remember being cornered by a group of parishioners saying, you're a priest, you should know that. <laughs> I said, I, I do know it. But if the priest is reading it, imagine how that makes the people who are coming in that don't know it feel because then they don't feel um, embarrassed. There's, I'm telling you right now, speaking with people that come into the parish that have been away probably since 2012, if not you know, later, uh, it's very hard for them to know how to respond because of those changes. It's now getting even harder now that those cards are no longer in there. And there, there, so there are things that concretely we can do to, to make people feel welcome and to encourage them to get back into the practice of the faith. Another one that I experienced was when I went to the um, Latin Mass that was celebrated in, in, uh, in Windsor just to expose myself to the tradition. Uh, I sat in the pew and uh, a woman came beside me with the red book that has all the parts of the Mass and went through it with me so that I didn't get lost. Uh, when I was in choir at one point there's this thing in the Latin Mass where the priest who's in choir has to take his hat off, put his hat on, take it off. It was very stressful. So I had an altar server sit beside me and his only task was to tell me when to put my hat on and when to take it <laughs> off. <laughs> but that helped, you know. Being conscious of the needs of others and not judging them, right? I, I mean, this person is here. This is an opportunity to have a positive experience. Like that's one of the reasons why I really get frustrated when we're encouraged to remind people on Christmas Mass and, and Easter to tell the people that they're supposed to go to church. I agree, I understand why we want to emphasize that, but my question is, is can we give them a reason to return? Can we tap them into the positive, good, and attractive quality of the faith and challenge them, but not do it in a way that's um, not meeting them where they are? I mean, they probably already know that I think that. So I'm not revealing anything new. I'm just turning what, what might be a positive in, encounter. So I, th I think those are things that we have to be conscious of at all levels, right? But let's, hospitality, greeting, all those things are good. But also keep in mind, and we're going to talk about this, these charisms are supposed to be operating outside of the liturgy. Right? So let's so we're talking about the parish. Yep. But keep in mind in the background of your thoughts, how might hospitality lead someone else to Christ outside of the liturgy? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, what could we do to make sure that person when they go to church isn't going alone? You know, those are those are things where we need to do stuff in the background too, right? Okay. Next table. Yeah. listening to what God was really saying to them so that they could bring it forward to um, a lot of other people. Preach it, sister. Preach it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, anything else? Did I let anybody out? <laughs> okay, 
All right, thumbs up. All right, next table. Knowledge and anything else? to get to know each other, and especially for people who are new to the parish, right? If, if you have something where there's food and there's drink, it, it beckons people to come in. So come on downstairs so we can get to know you, especially if it's like, hey, this is my friend Joe, you know, he's new to the area. So I think that circling around food at an event, you know, Sunday Mass is a regular thing everyone does. I know I wasn't a part of the parish here when they used to have coffee Sunday, but my husband was, and it was a very successful thing. So I'm not sure why it stopped, but I definitely think that bringing that back would be a very wise thing. And making it an every Sunday thing, not a once a month. Because then it's, oh, it's the one Sunday it didn't happen. That's when your new friend came to church. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Our, well, so say our parish is, uh, St. Patrick's is a good example of that. But like, what was it, um, what was it, Miss we were talking about, missing the coffee Sunday? And it came, it came, like, uh, there's a converse show up, and then they, they brought that, and that's what was missing, and yeah. it started to, yeah. to, to, to blow up, you know? <laughs> and people would come every Sunday, and just, uh, people would just meet, like, hey, how's it going? Especially so. Protestants, right? Like, yeah. Protestants, I don't know, like, I have a few friends that are Protestants. They go to church in the morning, they all gather, then they go to church in the afternoon. For Catholics, it's like everyone's rushing off to get bacon after like Sunday mass. See you later. Got my <laughs> reservation. That's a pro that's a problem, especially if we're going to convert our Protestant brothers and sisters. Like they need that because that is what keeps them essentially. You're not crazy. discouraging people to go to I'm Brian Machado's no, restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. He shuts down. <laughs> so, but it, it's just an, it's just an opportunity for people to gather and relationships to be built, and then. Everything else flows from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so th that's a very practical program that you could have that's ho hospitable. And what you need, though, is the charism of hospitality united to it. We're going to explain that. Uh, I also heard encouragement. Someone say encouragement from the table? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I'm going to speak as like the hardcore introvert. Okay, so this power to you. Do you want to stand on your chair while you do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there, when it comes to when it comes to you being involved in the church, there is nothing that I like. Not coming from a particularly faithful household, unless I was invited, mm -hmm. I did not feel welcome. Like hospitality is one thing, but if someone says, come and have coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise you kind of feel like you're crashing the wrong party. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, invitation is so, so important. And personal invitation, not just the person at the ambo saying, hey, come on down. Yep. It's really important. And the price is right. Come it on. Works for, it works for all of these terrorism. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I remember when I was in Stratford, they had a really vibrant young adult community there. And my friends, Steve Norman and Katie uh, Norman, they, at, at every mass, anytime they saw someone of their kind of age group or uh, they would invite them, you know, either to their whiskey tasting or to their social events, introduce each other. They, they were actually like, and they were normal people, like they weren't like the giving off stalker vibes or anything like that. But there, there's just that real sense of like, hey, nice to meet you, I'm glad you're here. Um, if you're looking for some things, this is what we'd love you to come out. And so I think that, that but see, that was not a program. That was an organic, natural flow from who these people were. And that's, that's, operating in a charism, not a program. Okay, next table. Um, we actually, um, <laughs> we'll probably do this collectively, we, we didn't get that far in the conversation where we nailed down some things. Sure. A little bit sidetracked, you know, not sidetracked, we're working through some other things. Um, but maybe I could beat a dead horse. Um, yeah, I'll beat it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, maybe if I can introduce another thought on that. Um, we're converts, that was a big struggle when we came to the Catholic Church. We were 
in our hearts convinced we got Jerusalem to call us, but it was a struggle because, because we're, we, we came from a small community of, um, we're, yeah, we're, we're people close and knew each other, and, and, and you welcome people, like you would when someone comes to your house, you welcome them, you give them everything. So, again, just to beat the dead horse, and uh, so I, I definitely agree with hospitality. My, my own thoughts on you guys are I think a discernment is important. And I guess when I'm calling out these things, I'm thinking um, it's not that they're not maybe op operating. I'm not suggesting that. I, I just think um, we could, we could, we could uh, grow up in these areas. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So discernment, uh, evangelism, I, I think also is, um, again, I think, I think um, when we first came to this community, I thought, wow, this is a community that seems to be evangelistic, more so than other communities that we've been part of. But again, I think we can grow. Um, more evangelistic uh, both in the uh, new evangelism type way and also the traditional evangelism type way. Sure. And then we can talk about hospitality. That's uh, wisdom and prophecy uh, with the other ones. Uh, I, I just think, and the reason I raise those are, are things that you want as a uh, growing faith community, you, you want those cares and operating to help uh, as a community. Okay, awesome. Thank well, you. Can I just tell a little story? Little. That happened to me last weekend. Okay. And this is for you too, though. It kind of puts the burden on you. But I. I <laughs> Any nails or? <laughs> okay, just keep in mind this is being recorded, so we might have to edit this out. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> that might be good. <laughs> but uh, at last weekend, I thought, well, when you're speaking, I thought, you know, I should have been doing that more in our church if we see somebody new, go and speak to them. But I went up to Fenland Falls to babysit. My husband and I went up to babysit for my daughter. They do not go to church. Mm -hmm. Max has never, their, their son has, our grandson has never been baptized, and it's a real issue for me. Mm -hmm. I spoke to her, I said, well, if your dad and I are going and you want to go away, they wanted to go away. They had never been away in the six years that they've been married and since Max was born. So we said we'd go up and babysit. So we went up and she was going to ask her husband if it was all right if Max went to Mass with us. But she forgot. So I said to her when we got there, is it all right if you know, take Max? Which we had to because... You know, there was only one driver. I don't drive when I'm a distance away. And so we took Max. We went to this parish. It was St. Al Aloysius. In Windsor? In Fenlon Falls. Oh, okay. I have no idea Near where Lindsay. you are. Okay. Lindsay, Spain? <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad at geography. Okay, I trust you. Okay, go on. Anyway, <laughs> it was... An, a very small little parish, a lot of Filipinos when we went in, oh, yeah. and a few white people. But when we went in, the priest, Father Louis, kept looking down at us because Max was the only child there, five-year-old child. And he smiled at Max quite often. Max asked, was asking me questions about the pictures on you know, the Stations of the Cross, and I was trying to tell him during Mass. But when we went up to communion, we brought Max up with us, and we, I told him that he was going to be blessed by the priest. I said, you can't receive the host. You can't receive the Eucharist, but you can be blessed. So he, we went up, and the, Father Louis got right down on his one knee and spoke to Max mm -hmm. briefly. But I thought, how wonderful was that? Mm. We all came back, and on the way out, Father Louis stopped at our pew and said, what is your name, little boy? Mm -hmm. And Max went, Max. And he said, that is a wonderful name. Mm -hmm. And we were leaving outside. Father Louis was talking to all his, the parishioners. And as we went by, Father Louis said, um, Max, I'd like to see you back here next weekend. Mm -hmm. And Max looked up at him and he shook his head. I thought, oh yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. we, we got the next morning, Chris and, the, and Nikki came home, and um, they, we were talking about this weekend. I said, so what are you kids doing next weekend? And 
Nikki said, we're going up to Ottawa. That's where John, or Chris's mom and dad live. And, and Chris says, yeah, we're going up there next weekend. And Max was sitting across the table from me. And he looked at me and he went, CC? He calls me CC. Remember? And I went, remember what, Max? And he came around the table and he whispered in my ear. Mm -hmm. He said, that man asked me to come back next weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, <laughs> I didn't know what to say to him, but I said, well, you're going away next weekend, Max, but maybe, maybe you could go the next weekend. So the, the short story is very long now, okay? <laughs> okay, but what, what I appreciate the, what the essence of what you're saying. How I, I just felt that was so wonderful that he was paid attention to so well, but right. I, I haven't done that to people that I don't know. So how important I really yes, think yeah. how important that is. Yeah, and, and, and it's I think part of what we want to talk about too is that a charism is meant to be an encounter with Christ, not with a human being. No. Through a human being. So if if the priest or a lay person is able to say, I want you to come back, that might and, and they're operating a charism, what Christ is saying to them is come to the altar. Come come to me. And what does Jesus say about those who don't allow the children to come to him? Yeah. Right? And so having that internal experience of being called, even though they may not have the language to articulate it, we have the job to say, you know what, I know the priest said that to you, but I think actually it was Jesus saying that to you yeah. through him. I wish I would have thought of that. Well, that's why we're talking today. Yeah. And, you know, we still have time, right? So last table over here. Mm -hmm. um, we have awesome, awesome music at Life Team. Dorothy's awesome, but I'm sure she'd love it if more people with the gift of music would help out. And all the other masses that we have, even during the week, if we had just people with the gift of music lined up to play, sing at all the masses, and I'm thinking prayer group, music ministry is always so important. You know, at a prayer group, it's difficult to get people to do praise and worship. And healing masses, mm -hmm. music ministry is so important. Yes, and, and I think it's um, something that we're definitely looking into. Um, there's all sorts of different types of music that we need to incorporate. Um, some traditional, uh, some contemporary, and we have to hold that all together. So what we want to be careful of is that we're not imposing a certain type of music on everyone but that we're calling forth the gifts that present the diversity of what the church allows for. And, and that's, again, that's not, not a charism. That's when we operate in the gift of our charism with the music, and so we're not talking about a natural gift here, we're talking about a supernatural one. And that, that's something we need to be operating in. So. That's a good point, and, and that's part of our worship, our worship. I, I remember I, I was chanting the Eucharistic prayer in St. Mary's, and there's a gentleman who, who came there and had been away from the faith, and he was in tears at the end of Mass, because he, he, he's, and I don't have that great of a voice, uh, but something connected to the chanting caused him to have an encounter with the Lord. And so God can incredibly use whatever form of music we're using, if it's you know, in union with the church, he can, he can allow a person to have an encounter with the Lord. And so that's a powerful thing that we definitely need to, to look into. All right, so I want to, um, we're a little bit behind, so I, I'd like to just go through a couple of these things and then we'll take a break. So I, I find one of the helpful ways to really understand charism. So right now we're kind of, in a certain sense, I think, unless we've gone through the workshop, we're operating a little bit in the dark about charisms. I, I think sometimes what we tend to do is we confuse programs with, with, with charisms. And don't get me wrong, programs are important. We can't survive without them. But they're, they're kind of the, the essential but not foundational needs right the foundational need is the holy spirit 
If a program's operating without the Holy Spirit, it will not pass on the faith. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So, uh, that's called... Well, anyway. Um, so, there are three things that we generally talk about. Now, when you were confirmed, it was probably just these two. Right? Does anyone remember what the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are? Throw some out. Courage. Courage, yeah. Everything. Okay, so there's wisdom, understanding, good counsel is another one. Okay, so what is a gift of the Holy Spirit, though? What is it? And, and St. Thomas Aquinas breaks this down beautifully. He just says it's a disposition that's imbued to the soul, a disposition or an ability. So uh, how do we d differentiate between the wisdom of the world or natural wisdom and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit? You know, a lot, of, a lot of people are not able to make that distinction out loud because there is wisdom that we can naturally have. That's why we have math textbooks, right? There is a certain natural wisdom that we can all enter into before we get confirmed. But we're talking about a different type of wisdom, a wisdom that goes beyond human comprehension. And, and that's, that's where the church is returning to a mysticism that's very important for us to meditate on. So I'll, I'll give you an example, a, a gift of, of knowledge, a disposition of it. I remember um, in my last parish of the cathedral, I was opening a door and this thought just came right into me. This person needs to be networked to a community of young adults. They, he needs people around him. And I need to talk to him on the phone was my conclusion from that. And right as I thought that, he called me, asking me to find a network of people in the community. So the word, word of knowledge, right? It's God giving you information that you would not otherwise come to know through a natural means. So St. John Vianney had that. He was able to read souls in the confessional. Uh, he, he, this one guy who was, you know, a bit agnostic came in with his dog and St. John Vianney looked into his soul and he said, it's a pity that, that your dog is more beautiful than your soul. But that actually, I mean, it's not what we would call today pastoral. <laughs> but this guy had a conversion because because St. John Vianney was operating in the charism, the man knew he was seen and known. And he was, St. John Vianney was holding up a mirror to him and he was able to recognize the truth of what he was saying. And so that's, that's where charisms are, are supernatural, right? So um, the Holy Spirit gives us these dispositions but we need to act on them. So we have often said these gifts can be given to your soul, but they can be left unwrapped and unutilized. And so what, what we need to do is be curious. I think that's the first stage. Wonder about how is God going to use this? And the only way we can do that is by trying to experiment with them. By acting on them. Like, Lord, stir up for me good counsel right now. And then act on it. But if all we do is passively wait for our body to be controlled by the Holy Spirit to say all sorts of things beyond our, our will, it'll never happen because that, that's not how he works. He doesn't uh, possess us in that way. Fruits of the Holy Spirit are the consequences of using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Fruits of the Holy Spirit are consequences. They're the product or that which they produce. So when we cooperate with God's will, we all of a sudden get joy, right? And, and I'm ta not talking about cooperating in an external sense. I, I mean it like we're operating from the very purposes and mind of God and heart of God. So we're operating in that gift of wisdom. We're swept up in it as we're operating in it. And so acting in the gifts grants the fruit as staying connected to the vine produces fruit on the branch. So if we're lacking fruitfulness, it's because we're not operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps we're operating in the wisdom of the world, in, in our natural state. And so God wants us to, to be producing gifts of the Spirit. Now, what are, what are different about the 
the fruits of the Holy Spirit from the natural fruits, right? Like we talk about love, what is the difference between a human love and a supernatural love, right? There's no greater love than to lay your life down for a friend. Look at the martyrs, right? The, the act that they did that, that was out of love for Jesus, uh, so much so that St. Lawrence was cracking jokes saying, turn me over, I'm done on this side, when he was being burnt alive. I mean, to be able to crack jokes and transcend all the pains and worries of the flesh, it, it's just incredible. And it's otherworldly. We cannot explain that from a psychological point of view except by the Spirit of God. And so that, that incredible transcendence of being able to defeat all forms of torture and manipulation out of love, out of a divine love for God, that can only be explained uh, by operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So third is charisms of the Holy Spirit. And every time I, I do confirmation prep, I always add this. Because, it's again, it's important for us to become very particular about how to go out on mission. You know, so RCIA, confirmation, baptism prep, all of that is missional. All of it is tied to our mission. It gives us something for gifts. So at our baptism and confirmation, we are given charisms of the Holy Spirit. And there's different types. There's, you can have permanent charisms, charisms that generally stay with you your whole life. Or you could have some that pop up every once in a while. Um, or maybe only once. I, I remember I was given the, the gift of tongues one time. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about that, that gift. I was at a retreat with the Legionnaires of Christ. Uh, it was um, in Cornwall, middle of nowhere. But um, Cornwall, Ontario. I'm sorry if anyone from Cornwall is hearing that. <laughs> They called it the armpit of Canada, but um, it was a nice place. People were very friendly. Um, but it was a field. We were in a field. And all of a sudden, I began praying in this way that uh, I can't explain. But there was nothing but faith in my heart. I knew I was expressing something. And I didn't know really what I was saying. But I knew it was love. And this other person that was beside me belonged to the Pentecostal church, which I didn't know. I didn't know him. And he had prayed for a sign that, because he was thinking about becoming Catholic, he had prayed for a sign that the Catholic church believes in the Holy Spirit. And so he turned to me and gave me this huge hug and was crying because he also interpreted what I was saying. So he was given the gift of interpretation which really gives us... So God just unleashed that gift on me once. Okay? Um, and that was for the salvation of his soul. It was enjoyable for me because there was a lot of, of unity and communion that I experienced in that with, with Christ. But it was primarily for him. It wasn't for me. And, and that, that's an important characteristic of a charism is that these are not self-important gifts, but these are gifts for the building up of Christ's body of the church. And that's, that's crucial. So I know when we sing at Mass, the disposition is not a performance, right? When we chant, when we do all those things, when we celebrate the Mass, we're drawing people's attention to God. And it's, um, uh, what's that Spanish phrase? Uh, no God. How do you say that in Spanish? Dio something? Okay, well anyways, there's a phrase in Spanish which basically if someone says thank you, they say no, God. Now they don't always realize that's what they're saying, but that, that's where it comes from is they're always directing people's attention back to the source of everything that's good. So charisms um, are broken down by Aquinas into basically three categories. They're knowledge, speech, and miracles. And uh, then you have the list of all of those that could be considered subsets of those gifts. Okay? Um, knowledge, speech, and miracles are there, and you see them in the life of Christ. And Christ says to the apostles, you will do greater things than I have. And he's not just speaking to the twelve, he's speaking to the whole church. So as Catholics, we do not believe that these gifts were given for a limited time, and then they expired. 
We don't believe that. We believe that the gifts have been given to the church to continue being the body of Christ, giving people miracles, signs, and wonders, and the proclamation of the gospel in a fruitful way, because Christ is still walking on this earth, but through the body of the church. And we are his hands and his feet. And so what, what do we see with Peter? He heals that man at the gate, you know? And so right, right away, we see that. So a charism is a supernatural gift that when married to a human activity, it uh, bears fruit for the kingdom of God, which is generally, we describe it as faith or something that disposes a person to faith. A natural gift is often confused or conflated with a supernatural gift. And that's where a little humility comes into play, right? So if let's say we're really good at a sport or something like that, and then all of a sudden we get puffed up in that greatness. That's not going to produce any spiritual fruit, right? And so if we recognize the fact that as skilled as we might be in something, we can't reach the depths of another person's soul with that natural gift, then we're saying that even with all the giftedness that I have, it will, it will be nothing if the Holy Spirit isn't connected to it. And that's the humility the church needs to operate in when looking for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why I mentioned last week that, you know, when I celebrate Mass, every time I bow towards that altar, I'm asking the Lord to allow me to proclaim the gospel worthy and well. I need that. I, I need that blessing. I need that help for it to mean anything to anybody. Um, otherwise, it's just Father Chris time, right? And, uh, and, and what a boring church that would be. Um, so a natural gift is where we operate without a, supernatural act, um, without a supernatural act in God. It does not produce spiritual fruit. So there's nothing wrong with natural gifts. They're like, they're like an empty bowl that's ready to hold grace. But we have to make that distinction in our mind. And we have to know... Um, that God has to bless it with more. So we think of the example of the little boy who produced a little bit of food for Jesus to feed the 5,000. Right? It was not enough for everyone. God took what he had and then blew it up. And that's what he's going to do with our natural gifts when he sends us the Holy Spirit. So why did Christ perform miracles? Was it to primarily deal with our temporal issues? The answer is no, this is important, you know. Um, miracles do address in part our temporal issues, but they don't ultimately resolve them. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus eventually died later. And so we, we know that the miracles were meant to generate faith in the lives of those that, in, he, that encountered, which is why God dispenses the gifts according to his wisdom. You know, sometimes through a, a tragedy, people come to faith. Sometimes through miracles, people come to faith. There's all sorts of different ways to encounter God in his miracles. And, and sometimes those miracles or charisms are manifest at time of death. I enc encountered that a number of times in ministry where there's this huge conversion and all that I had to do was show up in the hospital and celebrate the sacraments. And... And through faith, the family just felt the presence of God through the priest and through the sacraments. And so that, that's an incredible thing for us to note. So we as Catholics are not into the prosperity gospel. We, we don't take that approach to miracles where they become a God um, kind of subordinating his work to what we would prefer it to be. Rather, they are to serve the common good of the church to bring about conversion and a change of heart. And that, that's incredibly important. So if God heals us, it's, it's a visible sign of his love and concern for us. And so whenever we're praying for healing, we have to be in that place of saying, but for the sake of the kingdom of God, but for the sake of the building up of the faith, and, and ultimately for the healing of a relationship with God. That's the highest good, and that's what will unite us to God in heaven. Does that make sense? So, so miracles are important. God grants them to us. But often, you know, he would heal these people and then tell them, don't tell anyone. And they'd go around and tell everyone. 
right? And so they kind of missed the point a little bit, right? They got caught up in the gift rather than the giver of the gift. And the, the gift was meant to communicate something about who God was, and they, they got lost in, in, that, in that gift and failed to realize, no, like God came all the way down from heaven to look at you and to say, I love you, and here's a visible sign that I'm, I really do, and to heal that relationship. So we have to see that, and, and the, the healings continue to exist. I've witnessed quite a few of them. Why does a church perform miracles? Because we are Christ's body. We are cooperating with his will. We're continuing what he did 2,000 years ago, both in his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so the miracles that we can perform, maybe we have the gift or charisms of miracles of healing, but maybe we don't know that because we've never tried them out. We've never been taught that we could have them. But when we look at the lives of the saints, you know, some of them are floating. <laughs> Some of them are bringing healing. Our own brother Andre, St. Andre Bisset. You know, you go to the, the oratory and you see canes just hanging up on the wall. Um, how many people came to faith in a relationship with God through that? And uh, let's, let's believe that we can still do that today. So why does the church speak? Well, salvation really pertains to two things. It, it pertains to our knowledge and our love. Our ability to love God and our neighbor, right? That's the summary of the whole law. Um, but we can't love what we don't know. So we need to be instructed on who is our neighbor. That was one of the questions. And who is God? We, we can't love some vague sentiment. We, we have to love God. We have to come to know him. And this is where we as a church need to avoid what's called the heresy of indifferentism. So indifferentism is this view that, well, the, you know, God is some energy. He can be whatever you want it to be. Um, and instead of saying, you know, let's look at the Apostles' Creed and say, I love God for who he's revealed himself to be. I'm not indifferent to the fact that he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I love him for who he is. And I'm swept up in awe for how good that relationship is between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I always say, like, imagine if I went around telling people, my mom, she grew up in Toronto. Well, that's a bold-faced lie. She grew up in Sudbury, right? But maybe I'd prefer no one know that she's from Sudbury, right? How embarrassing, right? Uh, I don't actually think that, but what if someone did, right? I can't change the story of my mom to something that I prefer it to be. I have to fall in love with who she really is. And that's what we're doing when we avoid relativism or pluralism. It's not up to us to define who God is. It's up to him to reveal himself to us and then fall in love with that. Because whatever God is will be much greater than whatever we would come up our, with ourselves, 100%. So we can't love what we don't know. So God saves us by revealing himself to us. And when we really truly know him, we understand how good he is. And therefore we're drawn to love him affectionately in our emotions, but also in our choices to will, to will his glory. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas would say we cannot love what we do not know. And St. John Paul II, who did personalism, he would say we cannot deeply know what we do not love. And so he's talking about there, we cannot know what communion with another is like without loving them. We cannot know the depth of communion with another or self-gift. We cannot know that unless we're doing it. So there's, this is what we would call as, we can have an objective knowledge of God, but this is, we can have a personal knowledge of God. And we need both of them. So what God is objectively, and then by loving God for who he is and being in communion with him, that knowledge of him grows even more deeply. And so there has to be this practical action of loving God and being in communion with him to go even deeper. Does that make sense? So it's, it's quite a bit of uh, mind wrestling, but that's a, a summary of about 16 books written by both of them. Okay. Um, Knowing God, knowing the good as good changes our desires. So we're kind of in this world and 
we're drawn towards the good, but oftentimes it's kind of a misshapen good or an incomplete one. So with the sins of the flesh, we're drawn towards the good of pleasure, but it's disconnected from love, so it turns into lust, right? Um, or we're drawn to some food, uh, but it's disconnected from pr or temperance, so it turns into gluttony. And so uh, what happens is there's, there's a privation, there's something absent connected to that good. So God's given us all, all an appetite. There's three appetites that we have, but the deepest one is a spiritual one, and it's to be in communion with God. And oftentimes we, we don't even realize that that's what we're hungering for. We're chasing after all of these things, thinking that that will finally make me happy. And then we get it and we're like, I'm still searching for more. You know, I, I need this new cell phone, then all my problems will be solved. Or we just need this one program in our parish and then the universe will be saved, right? And, and all of a sudden, um, we're, we're, we're missing what we actually need, which is God. God is at the core. And so that, that's called idolatry, is we're replacing God with some other created thing. And as a result, we're, we're falling short. And God understands that this is a common error that we all make. And it, it goes to the song that we're looking for love in all the wrong places. And so we really, we really need the wisdom. Wisdom means that we we recognize that God is the ultimate good. That's really all that wisdom means. Is in, with our whole being, we recognize that God is the ultimate good for which we're hungering for. And so it can connect everything to that. Um, we, are, we are hungering for God, but confuse our appetite with worldly things. And God's, that turns into an addiction. So we have an infinite appetite. We have an, an appetite for the infinite. And we're looking into finite things. So what happens with that is I need an infinite amount of alcohol. It's never enough. I need an infinite amount of praise. I need an infinite amount of, of pleasure. I need an infinite amount of money. It's never enough, right? So these four idols of honor, power, pleasure, and wealth, do you see them anywhere near Christ on the cross? He has none of them. And yet, St. Thomas Aquinas would say that he was joyful because he had the one thing in his humanity that he ultimately hungered for, which was his Father, which was a communion with God. So there's two types of knowledge we should be aware of. Uh, it, it, there's probably more categories. This is just the way I describe it. Nominal knowledge. So we can have like a kind of vague understanding of our faith without kind of being in communion with the essence of it. And so I know all the rules, I know what I'm supposed to do, but there hasn't been a digesting of the implications or the beauty or the goodness of it. And so that's kind of like, um, kind of reminds me of this experience I had in, in, um, in a church in a galaxy far, far away. Where, where one of the um, Eucharistic uh, extraordinary ministers ran out of the precious blood. So he went over the credence table, grabbed the wine crew and poured more uh, wine into it. And I said to him, you can't do that. And he said, it tastes the same. Okay. So that, that's what I mean by nominal, okay, is, is that there's no sense of that Jesus is actually here, right? And, and, and that's where, you know, we, he doesn't just need to know what the church teaches about the Eucharist, but he needs to fall in love with that teaching. And, and that's where sometimes the disconnect can be, right? So my, my question is, you know, how did that happen? You know, in another parish I went to, in a different galaxy, okay, um, there's a, friends of mine, a friend of mine, his parent, or grandparents I got to meet. Lovely Italian couple, made really good food, did not believe Jesus was God. And, and they go to church every Sunday. And so I sat down at the table and I was not prepared for that. So they, they, they said, how can Jesus be God if he's God's son? And I, I, my instinct was, you've been going to church for how long? And it wasn't a criticism of them, but... Has anyone taught them? You know, where, where do we go back to the fundamentals of this? 
And, and are we teaching it just so that they have the right answer or that they have a relationship with that right answer, which is a person, right? An encounter with Jesus, who is God, who loves us so much that he became this weak infant just to be with us and to save us and lay his life down for us and do all the work, most of the work for us so that we could be saved. I mean, that, th you're missing out on a big love story there if you think that he's just the manifestation of St. Michael the Archangel, no offense to the Jehovah Witnesses, but that's just not true. <laughs> Charism of teaching and knowing. These charisms manifest in various forms, witnesses, witness to the ultimate good, that's God, and direct others to the richness of that goodness. When someone delights in their own knowledge of God, it draws others to know more. So, you know, just even a person who's studying the faith can inspire other people to want to learn more. I don't know if you've ever had someone who just likes to study in your life and you just became curious about what they were learning about and you wanted to know more as a result of that. So even the charism of just trying to study your faith and know more and then delighting in what you come to know and publicly delighting in that can be a means of, of a charism for the whole church. Um, so you can be an introvert here. That's, it's okay. Um, when someone teaches in this charism of knowledge, others come to believe as well what the truth is about God. So it's not just nominal knowledge. It sinks in on a deeper level, and sometimes you see that expressed in tears or in a, in a change of heart. So it's an incredible thing. Um, other charisms, there's no limit really to what charisms might be. We might classify them in different ways. Sacred Scripture gives us a list, um, which is basically what that's based on. Uh, but it's important for us to know what our charism is. And in order to know that, basically two things happen. One thing internally, which is that you get life out of what you're doing. And not in a prideful way. Uh, that's not actual life. That, that's something else. But, but it's kind of like you get swept up into something greater than yourself. You, you actually forget about yourself as you're operating in this charism. And all you're focusing on is God. And the other side of it would be that you see fruit produced in another person. Now, we don't always see that. But if God wants us to know what our charism is, when we're operating that charism, other people are going to benefit from it. And not just in a natural way, but in a supernatural way. So one of, one of them was, I, I remember when I was first ordained a priest, I was celebrating Mass, and this woman came to believe in the true presence just because of the way I was celebrating Mass. And, and she shared that with me maybe six, seven years after that. It had nothing to do with the actual style of it per se, but it primarily had to do with the fact that God, in that moment, gave me this, this faith to really believe that I was in front of Calvary, and she entered into that. It spilled over into her soul. And all of us can do that. You know, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross walked into a church and saw a woman who had been grocery stopping just stop by and kneel down in front of the tabernacle, and that's one of the main reasons for her conversion. What an ordinary thing, but married to supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit that caused the conversion of another. And all it was, was this woman grocery shopping, having faith, right? And so that, that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't have to have these big meetings to figure out how to salt, save the world. We just need the Holy Spirit connected to simple and uh, in, intentional thing. So um, looking through the list of charisms, what charism do you have? We talked about that. What charisms do we need to pray for? And we <coughs> talked about that. And how does it affect you knowing that you and the Holy Spirit are meant to operate together? So that's the more personal question that I'd like you to discuss, the third one. What does it mean to say that I actually have a supernatural gift in me and that God's chosen me to use that just like he did with all of his saints. So go at it. Third question. Thank you.
Oh, sorry, I, I changed it. So the question is, is, how does knowing that God has called you to a charism affect you? Affect you. Okay, so thank you. Um, I think one of, one of the couple things I would suggest is that anytime we, we reflect on it, it, it can make us both excited, um, but it can also be a burden of responsibility. And, um, and, and John Paul II talks a lot about love and responsibility. So those two always go, go together, is that a gift comes with responsibility. And remember that you have this gift, but it's not primarily for yourself. And so I always think of it in terms of Father Gerard and I made a promise when we were ordained to pray our breviary every day. And there's, there's five hours that we say. It's, it's not literally an hour each, but um, that's what it's called. And um, the people depend on our prayers throughout the whole world. And so the whole idea of, of praying that breviary is th that we believe that our prayers actually mean something and God actually uses them to benefit the people. And so uh, that responsibility is, is actually considered a mortal sin if we, if we break it. Um, because it's a, first of all, it's a promise that we made uh, in the liturgy at our diaconate ordination. So, you know, it's, it's like a marriage vow. Um, and second of all, because other, because people are depending on us to pray for them. And, and that really sometimes requires a conversion in the notion of what prayer actually is, right? And so that's true for all religious nuns and brothers, as well as priests. Um, same thing with charisms. God has given us talents. Sometimes we bury them. But what's the implication of that? Is that someone else is depending on this. So we need to dig that back out and use it. So um, with that said, um, Dorothy has prepared a video for us. We've been very briefly over the charisms, but if this is something that interests you and you'd like to look more into it, go deeper into it, I would highly recommend that. So I'm gonna play this video, which will give you some more information. God is calling you to a work of love that will fill your life with purpose and joy. And discerning your charisms can help you to discover that call. You may be wondering what charisms are and how they're different from our natural talents. Well, charisms are given to us by the Holy Spirit and they enable us to be an agent for God to others. When we use our charisms, we're energized and it fills us with an incredible joy. Some of the types of charisms are pastoral charisms like encouragement, helps, hospitality, mercy, and pastoring. Organizational charisms like administration, leadership, service, and giving. There's charisms of healing, healing, and intercessory prayer. Creative charisms, craftsmanship, music, and writing. Communication charisms, evangelism, prophecy, and teaching. Lifestyle charisms, extraordinary faith, celibacy, missionary, and volunteer poverty. And charisms of understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. Discerning charisms enables a parish to thrive on the gifts of its people. Far from being just another program, this is a whole new way to look at our parish. Called and Gifted is a charism discernment process developed by the St. Catherine of Siena Institute and it's being implemented by our Diocesan Pastoral Services Coordinator, Chrysandra Skipper. There are three parts of the Called and Gifted Discernment Program. Part one are the workshops. Five week workshop offered virtually Fridays from 10.30 till noon beginning October 27th and Thursdays from 7.30 to 9.00 p.m. beginning November 2nd. Part two is an individual interview facilitated by Chrysandra, which will take place virtually in December. And part three is the discernment small groups where participants will have the option to form small groups in person with people from our own parish community. All material will be provided for these small groups. The cost for the called and gifted discernment program is $65 per person. 
That includes a complete resource guidebook. We wanted to share with you some testimonies from our own Kent Lampton Roman Catholic family of parishes, parishioners, that have taken this called and gifted discernment process. I participated in the Siena Institute's called and gifted discernment course offered by the diocese about a year ago. The course was engaging and encouraging, and it provided the opportunity to meet a number of people from parishes across the diocese. A discernment process that I learned and practiced as part of the course helped me to discover a charism or gift I didn't realize I had and another I'm still discerning. The discernment of this gift has helped me to be more confident in using it as well as in how I pray and approach situations in daily life. Now I find myself asking in the various moments of the day, Lord, how are you asking me to use this gift you've given me here and now in this relationship or situation or conversation? The course does more than just pass along knowledge and information. It's designed to equip participants to recognize and exercise the gifts that God has given them for accomplishing his will and purposes through us. I felt truly blessed with having had the opportunity to participate in the called and gifted discernment course. It gave me an opportunity to learn and reflect about each charism and discover how God had gifted me with my charisms as well as the charisms of participants in my working group. I find I have a deeper relationship with God. I believe it makes me more effective and I can see how God is working in my personal and spiritual life. I would highly recommend this course to anyone wanting to deepen their spiritual life. I was invited to participate in the called and gifted discernment process last fall. It was through this course that I learned about the many charisms the Holy Spirit has available to give to us. I learned about God's unique plan for each of us and how using our God-given gifts will help us realize our mission in life. The course itself is well organized. We had videos to watch and discuss whole group as well as small group meetings. It was a great combination of prayer, reflection, and discussion. The personal interview with Chrysandra Skipper at the end of the course was amazing and inspiring. She was my guide through the discernment process to help me determine which charisms I might be gifted with. It was exciting to realize that God has been working with me in my life all along, allowing me to use my charisms in my family, parish, and life. When I was asked if I wanted to take the called and gifted discernment course, I reluctantly said yes. Having a very busy life and working on my own personal formation for years, I thought it may be a waste of the little time that I had. Much to my surprise, I absolutely loved what I was learning. I enjoyed sharing with the other people that were taking the course, some who I knew and others I had never met before. One thing I really enjoyed is looking at something I may be very familiar with through a different lens. This challenged me to go deeper into some areas of my faith life that I was not comfortable with. Embracing change is not easy, but it always brings growth. This is the upside I tell myself when I struggle with change. When I did my called and gifted inventory report, I was positive I already knew all my gifts. I was surprised by some of my scores. My interview to discuss the results helped me to wrap my head around what I should do with this new insight about myself. Experimenting with a charism I felt unsure of made me rely on God, not myself. I was witnessing God's work through me in an area I knew for sure was not my skill set. Knowing it was from God gave me the courage to try this. I am so happy I said yes. Taking part in a called and gifted discernment course was many things for me. Enlightening, thought-provoking, and liberating. By taking a deep dive look into how the Holy Spirit calls us to recognize and to use our God-given gifts in a supernatural way, we are able to shine and share in His wondrous ways and works. I was excited to learn about what charisms actually are and what they are not. By learning and understanding the difference, I was able to see more clearly and to embrace how I've been equipped to work for God's glory in my own life 
and ultimately in the lives of others. I was also free from the notion that I should be doing this thing or that thing simply out of obligation without his strength and power. Through the discernment process of prayer, looking inward with honesty and talking it out with others in the course, a charism I thought I might have has been confirmed within me. I was able to note other ways that I may be called to serve as well, and these I continue to discern. What a gift to serve with joy, confident that the Holy Spirit is working through me. This course has created a desire in me to come before my Lord in a more profound and purposeful way, to ask him what he desires, not only for me, but more importantly, of me. I would encourage you, whether you are sitting in a valley in your faith life, looking to deepen your faith life, or if you've been wanting and waiting to feel the Holy Spirit move you, take this course. Connect with the joy of your purpose and His. I took the called and gifted course about a year ago because I was asked by Dorothy and because it sounded interesting. I had just retired from 40 years full-time working, so thought this was a good time as I moved forward into a new stage of my life. I've been a Catholic Christian all my life and have been involved in or at least participated in various aspects of church life over the years, such as healing masses, adoration, parish council, community meals, Eucharistic ministry, prayer groups. I was eager to find out how I could better fit in, serve, participate or contribute using the gifts God has given me to share with others. Overall, taking the course was worthwhile because as well as discerning my own charisms, it also helped me to better recognize God-given charisms in others around me as we learned that everyone has God-given gifts to share, to meet needs, and to bring others closer to Christ. To be honest, discerning my own charisms was or is still not easy or totally clear yet, but I think that's okay because called and gifted discernment is a process And it's a way to explore and look for opportunities to use our gifts. I'm an introvert, which can make the discernment process more difficult. Some people, especially extroverts, make a clear and quick discovery of their charisms during the course. We were invited and challenged to find ways to experiment and practice with our newly discerned charisms. For some people, this was easy because they were already expressly using their charisms to help others with immediate need and to draw them closer to Jesus. For me and some others, we had to stretch somewhat to find out if the discerned gifts are indeed our God-given charisms. We had lots of opportunity to share and discuss with the others in our group afterwards, which gave both accountability and encouragement. I think the most important takeaway for me is to humbly recognize that God has given everyone, including me, gifts to be willingly and joyfully shared and used for his kingdom. Please consider joining us in this discernment process so that the gifts that God has given you will become visible as they unite us in a greater purpose. Thank you, Dorothy, for putting that video together. So those were testimonies from our own parish. So I think it's important uh, to see that this work has already begun, but I really do recommend um, looking into the possibility of of doing that because moving forward as a parish, um, before we start new ministries and do new things, I'd like to be very intentional about um, when someone's getting involved in a ministry to make sure that the charism matches what they want to do. I think it's a good good way. And the priest of the parish is supposed to uh, to be docile to what those gifts are in the parish, but also to be discerning. And, and that's important. So next I'd like to invite for Paul. Oh, Paul, no, Adam. Adam's first. To come and share briefly uh, what you're bringing forward uh, to the parish as well. So come on down. Bear in mind while I apparently get uh, dressed for the occasion. I assume that will be good right there. 
Okay, um, so yeah, Father had asked me to just quickly present a couple of the things that uh, I've been involved in and that we have going on in our family of parishes. And the first one is actually uh, an opportunity and an invitation to uh, the men in the room and the men in our parish of families, uh, family of parishes rather, um, which is a penitential men's group that's started within uh, our parish life here. Uh, where groups of men are coming together to deepen their intimacy with God, um, particularly by pursuing with this group of men an ongoing conversion of themselves and sanctification of themselves, primarily through uh, prayer and penance, um, again, beginning with ourselves so that we can reach out to the community beyond ourselves, uh, not just within our church, but to the town around us. Um, now, this is something that is principally... Um, you know, really discipleship building, as we've talked about in some of these different workshops that, you know, there's these steps of evangelization. Uh, once we've kind of had an encounter with Christ, this opportunity to become more like him through discipleship and then responding to the Holy Spirit's call to be apostles out into the world. Um, so this opportunity to be formed more like disciples um, is really here. And I think is very important, especially for uh, the men within our family of parishes. You know, out in the world, we are half the population. Um, but even here in this room, you know, we, we struggle to make up a third. Um, so how much more is that challenge um, for us men to really step up and um, own this opportunity to become more like Christ? Now, in the uh, realm of evangelization, which is what we've been working on here, uh, there's an opportunity by working on a lifestyle of penance, of taking the opportunity to recognize the times we have come up short, that we've not used the charisms that God has prepared for us, that we have um, made messes by our own sins uh, and kind of left a trail of wreckage perhaps from our own decisions, to work at picking up those pieces and restoring those things, we begin with that first step of evangelization of creating opportunities to build trust in the relationships that we have around us, that we take the focus off of what it is that we want and what we're doing um, and looking towards spreading um, God's love that he has for us with the community around us. Right? So again, this opportunity for discipleship, or discipleship becomes an opportunity to uh, display trust in the community around us. Um, so that's an invitation that is out there. If there's any men that are interested, um, that they can talk to me about what steps there might be in, uh, to get involved in something like that. Um, the next opportunity is one that uh, doesn't so much have like a, a group or a grand title, but is kind of a, a series of different opportunities uh, where there's a few of us that are trying to uh, instill or uh, we'll say reclaim the concept of uh, a festive attitude of our faith uh, and really reclaiming um, the holy days that we have as our faith. So when we talk about a, a holiday, you know, we're at Thanksgiving weekend, we use that word very uh, loosely. That word comes from talking about a holy day. Um, it's something that was special and tied into the celebration of our faith. And then we talk about a feast, uh, like we might be having a Thanksgiving feast. But the, again, the etymology of the word feast comes from the word joy. And these uh, festive happenings are supposed to be expressions of our joy as Christians in living out the love uh, uh, and connecting with the relationship of Christ and the grace that he is uh, working through us. So there are a number of things that we will see kind of coming up. Uh, so next week, October the 13th, will be an example of uh, such a thing. We have a mass and a procession in honor of our Blessed Mother uh, and the anniversary of her final appearance in Fatima, uh, where we will have mass, we will have uh, confessions, a outdoor candlelit procession, uh, time to come together in a, with a reception, a, a true feast of celebrating our joy for the many things that uh, our Lord and Our Lady have provided for us. But things to also look forward to will be an opportunity uh, December 31st, what we will often talk about as being New Year's Eve. But again, this opportunity to reclaim a holy day, that is the feast of Mary, Mother of God, um, or the Vigil of, because that's January 1st, the new day of the year that the church has honored Mary's motherhood uh, on that day. And we often 
forget that and lose that in celebrating the world's kind of rebirth of the secular year. And there's time and reflection there, but this gives us an opportunity to reclaim that day. And then another one which has been happening for a while, which some people here might be familiar with, is another festivity we have on the Feast of the Epiphany, which will be January 7th at the beginning of the new year, um, where we come together with different festivities, uh, come to pray as a community, these things. So there will be more of these things happening, coming throughout. And again, it gives us a way to really celebrate that joy, that um, to feast upon the graces that God has given us. But in the realm of evangelizing, if you're not, uh, if you are interested in helping out organizing some of these things, again, you can come talk to me. But even if organizing these things isn't a part of what God is calling us to, participating in them so that our life reflects this joy that uh, God is instilling in us is one thing. But it also has another element of uh, this evangelical process that fathers talk to us about. Um, in one way by provoking a sense of wonder, right? That was, you know, the second step after trust, where when we have something unique about our faith uh, that brings a joy to our life, how often when we get to those special feast days, does it make those around us really stop and say, why are they doing this? What, what is, you know, causing them to do this unique thing? Um, so there is an opportunity for that. It also provides an opportunity to challenge someone's uh, openness, right? That if someone is interested in the faith, if someone is responding to this wonder or curiosity in such a way that you might be able to um, prod them into thinking more about these special feast days in a real way um, and perhaps inviting them to kind of go further in their uh, seeking of the answers of this. And as Father had talked about where, you know, the Mass is not always the best place to do that because they can't fully engage in these things. Uh, having something like, for example, what is planned for the Mary Mother of God Vigil on December 31st will be a time of adoration. There will be festivities here in the hall. Um, there will be uh, the evening prayer of the church, Vespers. So these are things that anyone can participate in fully. Um, that they don't have to be a fully converted Catholic in order to dive into this. So our role in evangelizing through these things might just simply be to spread that invitation, to live out our faith in this joyful way that we're being called to. So the third one that I'd like to talk about is uh, something that a group of people who have been involved in uh, the liturgy here at the Our Lady Help of Christians site specifically, are trying to um, bring back an older thing that we used to have here, which is an altar society. So this is a group of people who are dedicating themselves to serving God in a particular way, particularly through um, the care and the uh, service and beautification of God's house and his liturgies. So there's um, various ways in which that might um, look. It might be involving ourselves in um, our prayer for those who are coming into God's house. It might be helping out with some cleaning or different acts of beautification uh, or serving in uh, various ways within uh, the parish itself. But what uh, we might think for evangelization from this is there's a, a story which some of you might be familiar with of St. Vladimir of Kiev. Now, this is a uh, Viking king uh, where we now have Ukraine and Russia uh, centuries and centuries ago, who was a pagan who became interested in wanting to find the true religion. And he sent stewards from his court across the world to look into different religions. And when they had come back, there was a group of uh, his representatives that had attended a mass and were so um, convicted with what they had seen, they reported that we didn't know if we were in heaven or still on earth, right? And is that the sort of um, representation that we give others through our own liturgy and through our own worship? Now, part of this can take place with the actual surroundings, the trappings of our liturgy, the beauties of our church buildings, um, there is something to be said when someone sees uh, our liturgy fully lived out that it can be captivating. 
but it also has something to do with ourselves and our own devotion to God working within us in that way that are we uh, invoking a sense of wonder when someone sees us reacting to the beauties of our own liturgy. So this altar society isn't just dedicated to the physical things around the liturgy, but also in its service in a personal spiritual way and furthering uh, these pious devotions in the community around us. So for those three things, the men's penitential group, uh, again, around surrounding these uh, festive happenings that will be uh, increasing and this altar society if anyone has any questions they can contact me about that so yeah there we go thank you adam and if you'd like his uh like to reach out to him please don't hesitate to um she's not stealing a book i, I dropped that off um <laughs> uh I, I do realize we're over time so we just have one uh one more um, so thank you for bearing with me. That was my poor time management. Uh, but I would like to invite forward Paul um, also just to share what's, uh, what we're looking at on the new horizon here. All right, I'll be, uh, I'll be quick. Um, speak loud. Speak loud, okay. How's that? How's that? Better? Okay. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you about two things. Uh, one is uh, Neary's Nook. Sorry, I'm going to go change my notes here. Uh, most of you have probably heard of Neary's Nook, but if you haven't, um, it's a lending library we have here at um, Our Lady of Help. And uh, you walk past it as you came in, uh, just in case you didn't know. I'll, on your way out, there's a, a bookshelf uh, off to the right. Um, it's, as I said, it's a lending library that um, is kind of the brainchild, no pun intended, of Adam Childs and Jack Monroe um, and uh, a couple others. Um, the intention of uh, Neary's Nook is to provide uh, good quality uh, books for uh, helping us to grow and, and be equipped in our faith. Uh, I think it was Matthew Kelly, I, I try to confirm this, but I'm sure it's him, who said, a good book can change your life. I, I don't know if he said that, but I'm declaring it today he did, or he may, he'll say it at some point. Um, <laughs> but there's a truism there. Good, uh, good books are, are really important. They can shape us and uh, help us to grow. And so, um, as I said, the purpose of Nearest Nook, uh, one of the purposes is to uh, make available good Catholic books to equip us in our faith. And so, um, uh, I just want to make you aware of that opportunity to, to uh, use uh, Neary's Nook, uh, tell others about it. Um, the other aspect of Neary's Nook is to provide, um, help sponsor educational opportunities, again, to help us grow in our faith. And um, an example of that one is coming up in the beginning of November, <clears throat> November 12th. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, a topic called uh, The Top 10 Books Every Catholic Should Know About. So you might want to check that out. It's a Sunday afternoon and um, about an hour in length. And, uh, and, and so the idea here is that, uh, yeah, there would be different topics uh, to help us, again, equip us and grow in our faith. And then finally, um, so use Neary's Nook, educational opportunities, and then finally, uh, we need members. Uh, members are people who buy membership for $30 a year, and that, um, that $30 is used to buy more books. It's kind of circular. And so uh, we buy more books so that we can uh, share them with others, we can use them and um, continue building uh, uh, the library. So that's Neary's Nook. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, some of you may be familiar with this uh, family catechism. Uh, for some, I think, here have participated in it before. Others, this may be new. Um, we'd like to start, if there's a, uh, if there's a desire and a, and a will, I guess, amongst us, uh, a family catechism group here in Wallaceburg. And... Um, it's kind of hard to explain. It's not really hard to explain, but it's kind of hard to explain unless you see it in action. But in, in a nutshell, a family catechism is about um, working together uh, uh, with other families uh, to learn our faith. Uh, but it's more than just, I would say, learning your faith, as in the catechism. It's also about um, uh, coming together as a community to grow in friendship. In, in, um, there's opportunity within that kind of, um, once the group starts going, to, um, to mentor one another, to form relationships amongst families, children, adults. Um, it's a real community of uh, encouragement, a, can, you know, a, a community of encouragement and building one another up in the faith, as well as we talked about growing in uh, understanding and knowledge for our faith, which again equips us um, uh, both as a church, but also to uh, reach out to others. 
um, my family, Joanne and I, and our kids, uh, when we first came into the church, we got connected with a family catechism group in London, uh, attended that group for, for quite a few years. And it was a real, uh, a real blessing in so many ways and a real encouragement. Um, and that's another, another, I guess, benefit, I think, of a family catechism group is, is it can be sometimes a, a soft landing place for, for um, people to come into the community because they can come into a, a place which isn't mass, it's not uh, church per se, but it's, um, but it's a place where they can come and get connected, build relationships, learn a little bit more about their faith, uh, maybe if they're just coming back to the church. So, um, so we're having an information meeting, I guess, so the whole point of this is to say, we'd like to start a family catechism group. We're going to have an information meeting to talk about it in a little more detail on Sunday, October 29th at 2 o'clock here in the parish hall, if you're interested. Um, and then the, the final thing I would mention on that is, um, it's called family catechism, but it's not geared just to families with young children. I mean, it, it is geared towards that for sure, but um, the group we participated in London, I, I think of the makeup of that group, and um, we had uh, young adults, we had singles, we had families with young children, we had, um, I guess, people like me now, <laughs> older people whose children are growing out of the house, uh, and older than that, you know, we had some uh, grandparent age. And uh, honestly, the, the group is enriched by that variety and, and um, experience and people in different ages and stages of life. So. So that's Family Catechism. Uh, again, uh, if you have more questions, come talk to me or um, come out to the information meeting. There'll be an announcement in the bulletin on uh, Sunday, October 29th. Right, thank you. Okay, so we're, we're wrapping up now. Um, so those are just some, some programs that um, we're putting out there. Now we'll send an email out summarizing what's available and the contact information so that you're able to connect with those things if, if you feel called to. Uh, I, I definitely um, am excited about this kind of increase of devotion within our parish as well. Like I wanna be able to celebrate our parish's feast day. So, uh, a little while ago on September 29th, we celebrated the feast day of St. Michael the Archangel at, um, at uh, St. Michael's uh, Church. Um, I would encourage, if you can, please come to the candlelight procession that we're going to have next weekend. I want to be very clear, even though Mary appeared in Portugal, she's for everybody so this is not a portuguese event this is for all people okay um, now the reason why i say that is many people haven't been involved in it in the past because they thought it was just for the portuguese the portuguese people want you to know that all are welcome right anyone portuguese here okay <laughs> <laughs> so so just um, please and please also invite people maybe that haven't been to church in a while um, I think that it'll be a very beautiful and, and wonderful experience we're inviting all the little children if they'd like to come dressed as angels um, so it's just a, a beautiful opportunity to celebrate this feast as, as a parish and I'm also very excited about uh, catech um, FFI or family catechism uh, because I think that um, I've seen its fruitfulness in other places and it really does weave the community together. Um, the last thing that I'll say, um, there are a number of things that we're looking into. One, um, I, I've heard an, from a number of people even before today uh, for the need for, for knowledge and teaching. Um, so that's kind of my arena. That's where I'm most comfortable. Uh, that's where I find charisms in my own life. And so I, I'm going to be offering um, something I haven't figured out the dates yet for it because it's a bit of a spiral with my calendar right now. Um, but I would like to offer um, courses on what's called Catholic wisdom. So looking at um, uh, the wisdom that, of some of the saints and for those who are interested in growing in the intellectual aspect of their faith. If, and I noticed when I sent out that the... Um, uh, survey that a number of you had mentioned that you don't feel comfortable enough right now sharing your faith because you feel like you don't know enough and uh, and and I think that's a really beautiful thing because that means there's hunger in there to learn more and I'd be happy to support you in that um, and I find that teaching also uh, excites me about the Lord and the beauty of what he's done but it also helps me learn more too along the way so that's it. I'm, I apologize for going over time. You've been um, champs. 
Don't, don't slash my tires. Um, but anyways, we'll end with a, a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, I thank you so much for the witness of, of these, your children, who have come here. Uh, desiring to, to spread your gospel and to learn more about how we can practically do that. This is a constant learning process for all of us, and I just ask you to be patient with us as we as a family of parishes continue to work together to do your will and to allow others to encounter how good you are so that their lives may be encouraged, they may be freed from sin, and that they may be brought into eternal life. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.